learned in uh, the last session or in the last intro, we began our day today talking about maths, talking about physics. Later on, we've talked about fear. And even later on, we've talked about professionalism. However, as professionals, we should be doing test-driven development. And this is all about the very last session of today. Nothing more to add. Bob, once again, the floor is yours. Warm welcome, please. <laughs> the chemical formula of water? H2O. Good. Which stands for? Two hydrogens. Dihydrogen oxide, thank you. Two hydrogen, one oxygen. What does the molecule look like? Mickey Mouse. Good. All right. I was waiting for someone to say that. Uh, let me show you what the water molecule looks like, because it's a fascinating structure, if I can get my pen out. Man. Here, there it is. Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. So a water molecule looks like this. Two hydrogens, one oxygen, just like Mickey Mouse. Now, at the center of each of those atoms, there are protons. And protons are positively charged. So there's a proton there. There's a proton there, a bunch of protons in here. And around the outside of those protons, we've got electrons, right? a cloud of electrons just hanging out around here. Now, the electrons repel each other. So why does this molecule stick together? They're repelling each other. Why, does the, why, do, these mole why do these atoms stick together? So there's, you know, there's this whole business of, you know, uh, the oxygen is, it wants eight, but it's only got six, and it can borrow one from the two hydrogens, and that makes eight. And does that satisfy you? Right? I mean, that's what chemistry teachers will tell you. Oh, you know, it's eight. So there is a reason why it's eight, by the way, and I, we don't need to go into the reason. It's actually a very clear reason why it's eight. It has to do with the geometry of the situation. But never mind that for the moment, because there's a much easier explanation here. If you were an electron, where would you like to be? As close to those protons as you can get. Well, that means you're right here. Those, pro those electrons want to be right there, and they want to be right there. So the, pro the electrons are going to gather there. Now, the electrons will flit around the outside. But if you measured how long they were in a certain place, they would spend much more time close to those protons than they spent anywhere else. Now, what are those protons doing? Well, the protons see that big wad of electrons sitting there. They get attracted to it. And the electrons are attracted to the protons, and the protons are attracted to the electrons, and the whole molecule sits there stably. That's what the nature of a covalent bond is. The covalent bond allows those electrons to be there and to associate very closely to the protons, and so the whole thing sticks. Now, this leads to an interesting, interesting side effect. One side of the molecule is more negative than the other side. The electrons gather on one side, not on the other side. So one side is more negative, the other side is more positive. That means the molecule itself is a dipole. It's an electric dipole. It has a positive and negative side. This is why water is wet. Water sticks to your hand because all the little molecules rotate to match the charges on your skin, and then they stick there which is kind of cool. This is also why water is a, a good solvent. It dissolves things because all the little molecules can rotate until they stick to whatever they want to dissolve. So this is one of the things that makes water work for us. Now, one of the interesting experiments you can do with water is to get a, a nice little faucet. You do this for your kids or your grandkids because they'll love this. Right? You, get, you get a faucet and you get a little stream of water coming out of the faucet. It has to be a nice, pure stream, but as small as you can make it. And then you get a balloon, and you rub it on your head, and you hold the balloon close to the water stream, and the water stream will bend over to try and touch the balloon. It's a very cool thing to see. I'd like to say it's because the water molecule is a dipole, but it's not. It's because there are ions in the water. But you could cheat and say that it was the dipole. 
One other thing you can do with water that your grandkids will love or your kids will love if you have kids, get a nice glass of water, get, no, get five 9-volt batteries. You know the batteries that have the two prongs on the top? Then you can stack the batteries together so that all five of them are in series. You'll get a nice 45-volt battery. Put a little bit of salt in the water, just a little bit, not much. Take two wires, attach them to the 45-volt battery, and dip those two wires in the water, but don't let them touch each other, and you will immediately see little bubbles forming on the wires. One side will be hydrogen, the other side will be oxygen. 45 volts is enough to tear the, tear the hydrogen atoms off the oxygen atoms, and it'll accumulate there. If you're very careful, you can put a little card in there and catch the hydrogen and oxygen, maybe put it in a couple of balloons. That would be cool because then the hydrogen balloon would go up to the ceiling. Or if you're not cool, what you can do is just let it accumulate in the glass. You let it run for maybe a minute or so while the kids are watching. What are those bubbles, Dad? Oh, wait, watch this. And then at the end of about a minute, you get a match and you hold it up to it and it goes... <laughs> which the kids really like. Now, about five minutes into this, that glass of water is going to be hot and the batteries will be discharged because there's a lot of current running through that water. So you get another batch of batteries, and you keep, uh, keep at it, right? Just keep at it. Keep pumping more and more batteries through this thing, and eventually you'll get down so that there's hardly any water left in that glass. And the water that is left in that glass will be enriched in deuterium dioxide because heavy water, water that is made of heavy hydrogen, does not want to be pulled apart as much as regular water does. Now, you could keep doing that over and over and over again and get yourself a glass of enriched deuterium dioxide. And then you could keep doing it over and over and over again until you had a whole big glass of heavy water. Cost you probably $10,000 in batteries. But that would be cool, wouldn't it, to have a glass of heavy water? What would you do with a glass of heavy water? Drink it? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I was still talking about estimates. Yes, yes. Yes, astrophysical reactions obey the Newton's laws, yes. So we can say also that uh, the chemical things are uh, related to the Mendeleev table. Chemical things are related to? Mendeleev. Yes, Mendeleev's table, the periodic table, so yes. Yep, yep. I like where this is going. The of the What's that? The structure of the kin, the parental structures. Yes. They also according to the atomic disk. Uh, oh, we're going to the parental thing now. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the this is great. They found some invariances in the incest that is never found in other populations. So my question is, relating to the code, what are the invariances? Uh, Relating to the code, what are the invariances? They are real uh, things that will never change as a structure. Okay, okay, I see what you did there. Okay, so, so the periodic table is a table of invariances, things that don't change amongst the elements. And the, the, the population trees are tables of invariance, things that don't change along the family lines. What are things in code that don't change? What a great question. It's not on my list of things to talk about, but okay. What do we do, we programmers? What's our job? What, what do we manipulate with our hands? <laughs> he said keyboards. Now I'm going to hit him. <laughs> Sequence, selection, and iteration. That's what we do. All the programs you have ever written are combinations of sequence, selection, and iteration. Two, sequence, two, two lines of code in a row, or lines separated by an if statement, or lines in a while loop. That is what we do. That is what we have done since Alan Turing wrote his first line of code in 1946, and we've been doing that ever since. That is a fundamental invariant of programming. Sequence, selection, and iteration. How many languages are there in the world? How many computer programming languages are there? Thousands, thousands of them. Why? Why are there so many? How many do you know? How many languages do you know? Who here knows more than three languages? 
More than five. More than ten. Okay, now it's starting to go down, but we got some guys in the room that know ten. More than fifteen. Do you even have that count? The guys who know more than ten probably know more than twenty, but they've just forgotten half of them. <laughs> Why so many? And, and have you noticed that there are new languages coming out? Swift, Swift, a brand new language created by Apple. Right? Kotlin, Kotlin, a language created by the IntelliJ guys. Go, Go, a language created by Google. Rust, Dart, Elixir, all these new languages, they're so cool. And what are they made of? Sequence, selection, and iteration. That's all. For 30 years, we have been on the hunt for the golden language, the one language to rule them all, the language that's going to make us all sigh with relief and go, oh, thank God, at last there is a language that I can deal with. This language does not exist. But we are going to keep looking for it. We are going to keep spinning around and spinning around, inventing new languages and vending new languages, hunting for the golden language that does not exist. You think there's anything new in Elixir? No, there's nothing new in Elixir. It's just a bunch of old stuff that's been shuffled around in different ways. You think there's anything new in Kotlin? There's nothing new in Kotlin. Anything new in Dart or Rust? Or any of those languages that I just mentioned, there's nothing new in any of those languages. It's just a reshuffling of old stuff. No one has invented anything new in a language probably since Prologue. Anybody ever write Prologue? Yeah! And you're still alive, man. There's a language that'll screw around with your brain. I don't know exactly what to do about this because in some ways the hunt for the language is healthy. It's nice to have new languages to play with. But the more I see new languages, the more I realize they're old languages. They're not new. There's no new ideas. That's really weird. Software technology went through a period of very rapid discovery. I won't even call it invention because that's not right, discovery. But that period was from about 1946 until 1970. After that, there were almost no new innovations. When, when was the first object-oriented language written? 1966. When did Dijkstra publish structured programming? 1968. When was functional programming invented? That's a really interesting question because the first computer programming language that was functional was Lisp in 1957, but functional programming was actually invented in 1936 with predicate calculus. What else has happened in our industry that's really interesting? What innovations have we had? Who? Quantum. When one of those works, you can talk to me. What new innovations have we had in the last 40 years? Yes, it's very interesting. There hasn't been a lot. The invariants in programming are sequence, selection, and iteration, and those are what we do. Our job has not changed much. Now, the hardware has gone through crazy stuff. The hardware has gone absolutely nuts. How many transistors are in this thing? Well over a trillion. Well over a trillion transistors are sitting in this iPhone right here. 10 to the 12th. Are they all the same? They're small. Are they all the same? Yeah, they're pretty much all the same, right? They're photo photographed down onto it with x-rays down onto a little silicon sheet. What if you wanted to build this out of vacuum tubes? You'd need a trillion vacuum tubes. Where would you house a trillion vacuum tubes? How big a building would it take to house a trillion vacuum tubes and all the associated electronics? Okay, <laughs> the moon. You know, that's actually pretty close. It's 150 vehicle assembly buildings, the big building at NASA you know, that we build the Saturn V rocket in. You need 150 of those to simply house the electronics. It would weigh as much as 2,500 aircraft carriers. It would consume... One watt per tube, to be generous, 
a terawatt of power, a trillion watts of power, forcing us to build 500 nuclear power plants, each one capable of generating two gigawatts. How much would it cost? $50 a tube? $50 trillion, the economic output of the world. And once you had built it, there would be no one to call. <laughs> I hold in my hand the economic output of the world in 1952. And we give them away in lots of hundreds of millions if you sign a little paper for two years of a service. Right? That is the level of change that has occurred in the hardware. The hardware has gone through so many orders of magnitude in change that it's, it's hard to compare. Comp just do that size analysis. It's easy to say that this is 22 orders of magnitude more powerful than a vacuum tube computer. 22 orders of magnitude. That is the number of angstrom units between here and Alpha Centauri. That is the number of atoms in the contents of my pockets. That is a very, very large number, and I've lived through that number. I saw those 22 orders of magnitude. I saw that change, and it was all change in the hardware, not change in the software. If I took a programmer from 1968, and I transported that programmer in time to here, and I put him in front of my laptop, and I showed him IntelliJ and Java, he'd need 24 hours to recover from the shock. But then he, or in fact, most likely it would be a she from 1968, would be able to write the code because the code's not that different. I could show them Java and they'd say, oh, classes, yeah, that's that Simula stuff, right? That's OO stuff they did in Oslo. Cool, you're doing that now? Cool, okay. If I took you and I transported you back in time to 1968, I put you in front of a PDP-8, I showed you how to edit code on paper tape, You'd need 24 hours to recover from the disappointment. <laughs> but you could write the code, because the code hasn't changed that much. Thank you for introducing that topic for me. Yeah? It's a good topic. Anyway, we were talking about estimates, weren't we? Hmm. I expect that you will say no. I want you to carefully consider why you were hired. You think you were hired because you can write code, and that's partially true. But there's another more important reason why you were hired. You were hired because you know. And that gives you a very special ability. It is the, abil the ability to know when the answer is no. You can do that. Nobody else can do that. And the company, your employer, your peers, everyone around you expects you to say no when the answer is no. It is the most valuable thing you can say is no. You can prevent the company from going off a cliff by saying no. You have to be able to say no. Now, you should also work very hard to say yes if there's some way to get a job done. But if the answer is no, you must be able to say no. It's very difficult for programmers to do this. Programmers don't like confrontation. We did not get into this business because we like people. We like machines, right? And people are okay from time to time in, in reduced quantity. We have to be able to say no when the answer is no. It's one of the most valuable things we can say. So, I, by the way, I don't expect all the junior programmers to go running around going, no, 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 that's a bad idea. The senior people need to be able to say no when the answer really is no, no matter what the pressure is. I expect that you will be able to deal with pressure. The pressure is going to come. There's no doubt about that. Managers and, 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 and executives and the company as a whole is going to put you under pressure because pressure is real in the business world. And so the pressure is going to come. You need to be able to deal with it. And you need to be able to deal with it better than simply um, saying, well, it's all their fault. That's a passive-aggressive approach. It's a bad idea. 
So I expect you to be able to say no when the pressure rises and the answer really is no. Let's say a manager comes to you and says, we need this by next Tuesday. And you realize that there's no way. You can't get it done by next Tuesday. It's not going to happen. You have to be able to say no. Oh, you don't understand. We've got to have it by next Tuesday. It's really important. And you, you go through your head and you think through all the options and, and you realize there's no way. It's not going to happen. You have to be able to say no. No. You're going to have to deal with some other thing, but it cannot be done by next Tuesday. And then watch out for this one because it's insidious. Because right? the manager may come to you with this very interesting manipulation. Will you at least try? <laughs> now here's the thought process that should be going through your mind. The words should not come out of your mouth. But in your mind, you should be going, how dare you accuse me of not trying? You, and then stop there. <laughs> and then you respond much more appropriately by saying, we are trying. We are all trying our best. There is no extra trying we can do. The answer is no. Be very, very careful. The temptation there is to say, well, yes, of course we'll try. And what you have just, just done is lie. Because the fact that you said you would try is not going to change your behavior. You don't have a strategy for yes. You are going to do exactly what you would have done had you said that you wouldn't try. Just don't let yourself get caught in that trap. And that is enough for that talk because I want to do another talk now, which is on test-driven development. And I asked you, I think, before, who's doing test-driven development? Okay, good. And that's a few of you, not enough of you by a long shot, but at least it's some of you. And uh, let me just define what test-driven development is, and then we'll see how many people are still raising their hands. Test-driven development is a discipline. Disciplines are arbitrary, or at least they have arbitrary components to them. Disciplines have arbitrary behaviors that are driven by some substantial motive. So, for example, how do doctors wash their hands before they do surgery? Do they just go in there and go, do okay, ready? No, they have a discipline. And discipline looks something like this, depending on the country and the hospital and so on. But the discipline looks something like this. There's a special brush and a special soap, and they turn on the water, and then it's 10 strokes across the side of the finger, 10 strokes across the top, 10 strokes across the other side, 10 strokes across the face, 10 strokes across the nail. Next finger. Now, that's interesting, right? You understand why they do that. There's a motive behind that. But is 10 the right number? Could it be 12 or 8? It's arbitrary. It's just a guess. 10, probably enough. Do they have to divide the finger into those four quadrants and then the top part too? Could they divide the, the finger into three, tri three sections? It's arbitrary. So what I'm going to define for you now is test-driven development. You, what you have to realize is that part of this discipline is arbitrary. It's just there because of a guess. But the guess is motivated by something real, just like the brush strokes are motivated by getting the germs off your finger. The, the discipline is motivated by something real. The discipline of test-driven development works like this. There are three rules, and you have to follow all three of them. The first rule is you are not allowed to write any production code until you have first written a test that fails because the production code doesn't exist. Now, right away, that sounds stupid. If you're a programmer of any year's experience, that just sounds dumb. Like, what are you supposed to write? How do you test code that doesn't exist yet? What test are you going to write? So it doesn't make any sense right off the bat. But never mind that, because the second law is much worse. The second law says you are not allowed to write more of a test than is sufficient to fail. And not compiling is failing. So as soon as the test fails to compile, you must stop writing it. Now this is absurd because the first thing you're going to write is a test against code that does not exist, so it won't compile. And this, this puts you in this horrible loop. You will write a line of, of unit test 
it won't compile. You will have to go over here and write a line of production code. That will make the unit test compile, and now the third law kicks in. And the third law says you are not allowed to write any more production code than is sufficient to pass the currently failing test. So now you're stuck in a loop. And this loop is five seconds long. Uh, I got to write a line of unit tests. Oh, it doesn't compile. OK, now I got to write a line of production code. Oh, that made it compile. OK, another line. Of, this is your life now. <laughs> around and around that loop, five seconds long. And if you're a programmer of any year's experience, this sounds stupid. Why would you do anything like this? You would never be able to write an if statement without interrupting yourself. You would never be able to write a while loop without interrupting yourself. You would never be able to finish a thought. You'd never be able to write a function. This would be tedious and slow and boring and annoying, and it's exactly right. It's exactly what it is. But, and there had to be a but, didn't there? Imagine a group of people in a room like this following these three laws. Pick anyone you want of, of those people, any time you want. Everything they worked on worked a minute ago. And it doesn't matter who you pick. It doesn't matter when you pick them. It all worked a minute ago. What would your life be like if everything worked a minute ago? And this was always true. Everything worked a minute ago. How much debugging would you do? Who's good at the debugger? Who's got the debug foo in their fingertips? You know all the hot keys. You know how to set break points and watch points and, and then break six times over here and then break seven times over here and wait for this variable to be a 37. You can really debug. This is not a skill to be desired. You don't want to be good at the debugger. The only way you get good at the debugger is to spend a lot of time debugging. I don't want you to spend a lot of time debugging. For you, I want the debugger to be a tool that you use once a month and you've forgotten all the hot keys. You don't know how the heck to do a break point or a step into or a step over. That's how I want your relationship with the debugger to be because I don't want you spending a lot of time debugging. Now, do I use a debugger? Yeah, but not very often. And even when I do use a debugger, I use it for an extremely brief period of time because I set a breakpoint in some test that's failing and I step, 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 oh, some dumb thing I did over there because whatever it was, I did it a minute ago. Now, I could tell you that by following these three laws, you would reduce your debug time by some very large fraction. So keep that in mind. Who here has integrated a third-party project? You download a bunch of stuff from the web. It's a zip file of some kind. You unzip it. Inside, there's a bunch of class files or, or a bunch of source code or something. Inevitably, in there, there's going to be a PDF written by some tech writer. And at the end of that PDF, there's going to be an ugly appendix with all the code examples. Where's the first place you go? You go to the code examples, right? Because you're programmers. You don't want to read what the tech writer wrote. You want the truth. And the code will tell you the truth. So you will go to the code examples to figure out how to integrate this system. If you're lucky, you can copy the, copy the code out of the code examples and paste it into your application and fiddle it into working. When you're writing code with these three laws, what you are writing are the code examples for the entire system. You want to know how some object needs to be created in this system. There's a test that creates that object every way it can be created. It's a short little test, just a few lines long, tells you exactly what you have to do. And it catches every exception that can be caught, every exception that can be thrown. It deals with every argument that can be passed in. There's a set of tests that tell you exactly what to do. You want to know how to call an API function in this system? There is a test that calls that API function every way it can be called. Nice little example. And these tests are not themselves a system. They are all decoupled from each other, and they have a one-way coupling to the system itself. They are short snippets of code that explain how one part of the system works. On top of that, they are written in a language that you intimately understand. They are absolutely unambiguous. They are so formal they execute and they cannot get out of sync with the system. They are the perfect kind of low-level documentation for any system. You want to know how the system works, you read the tests. The tests will tell you everything you want to know. So if you are following these three laws, 
you get a kind of documentation that is the envy of the world. It doesn't give you all the high-level information you need, but it gives you every bit of the low-level information you need. You want to know how something works in there, the tests will tell you how it works. How many of you have written unit tests after the fact? How much fun is that? It's not fun. Why isn't it fun? Because you already know the code works. You tested it manually. So why are you writing those unit tests after the fact? Because somebody told me I had to. And so now you get into kind of passive-aggressive mode. And even if you're really conscientious, you think, okay, I'll write this test. And yeah, I knew that would work because I tested it manually. Write this test. Yeah, that one worked too. And inevitably, you will come across the code that's hard to test. It's hard to test because you did not design it to be testable. You weren't thinking about that when you wrote the code. So now all of a sudden you've got a problem because in order to test this function, you're going to have to decouple something or break some dependency or restructure the code. And you look at your watch and you think, yeah, come on, I already know this code works. And you walk away. And you leave a hole in the test suite. Remember when I said you've got to trust that button? You just left a hole in the test suite. And you know if you are leaving a hole in the test suite, everybody else is leaving holes in the test suite too. And that leaves you with a test suite that executes just fine, but when it passes, your reaction is, huh. yeah, it passed. Doesn't mean anything. Because you know there's holes in it. A test suite that does not allow you to make a decision when it passes is a useless test suite. Oh, it might help you sometimes if you break something, but most of the time, you're going to run that test suite and it's going to pass and you will know that that doesn't mean anything because you know there are holes in the test suite. You cannot trust it. You should think of the test suite like a parachute. How many holes do you want in that parachute? When you write the tests first, following the three laws, something else happens. First of all, it's fun. Now, I don't mean it's like roaring fun. But you do get this, this lovely little experience of writing something that fails and then making it pass. And every time you make a test pass, there's a little shot of endorphins to the back of your brain. Yeah! Right? You watch a bunch of pair programmers, two, two guys working at, a, working at a terminal, and they're making tests pass and writing tests that fail, make it pass. Every time they make a test pass, boom! Little, ha oh, yeah, no, whoo! There's always some little gesture, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm a programmer. I got an if statement to work. So there's this element of fun to it that you don't get with, with unit testing after the fact. But more important than that, you cannot write the code that's hard to test. If you write the test first, you cannot write the code that's hard to test. Right? Because you're writing the test first, and that means you're designing the code to be testable. And there's another word for testable code. It's called decoupled, because that's how you make testable code. You make it decoupled. So the very act of writing the test first forces you to decouple things that you never thought to decouple before. Now, all of these things are good. And, you know, they're good benefits. We like those benefits. It's fun. You get good documentation out of it. It reduces your debug time. All these stupid three laws that you really don't want to do really have a profound effect but the most profound effect is that button and the fact that you trust it. And if you trust that button, all the effects that we talked about in the last hour come to you. Yeah. Uh, just a question. Just a question. Uh, who should be writing the tests for the graphical user interface. So here's the thing about GUIs. They're really hard to test. Now, why are they hard to test? Why, why are GUIs hard to test? I using test-driven development, it's very difficult to do test-driven development for GUIs. Why is that true? And the answer to that is you don't know the right answer. You can't write the test and know what the right answer is. You know, like, like uh, where should this division be? You know, should it be... 0.1 inches over, or 2.2 inches over, or 0.3 inches. You can't write that test because you don't know what the right answer. 
So what you do instead is you fiddle around with the CSS and you fiddle around with the HTML until it looks right. You can't write the test any other way. So that, what that means is that you can't do test-driven development easily, and I don't do it at all, for GUIs. So what I do is I move all the intelligence out of the GUI, and then I test the GUI code, the intelligent part of the GUI code, outside of the GUI, and then I don't have to test the GUI itself, which is nice. Now, you asked me a, a more interesting question. Who should be writing the test for the GUI? The programmer's writing the GUI. That's it. If you're, writing, if you're a programmer and you're doing test-driven development, you are writing the tests for the code that you are developing. Programmers write those tests. In fact, that's, that is my favorite definition of the word unit test. We don't know what the word unit means, so never mind. So we call them unit tests, but really these tests are tests written by programmers for programmers. So when I'm writing code, I write a little test, I write a little code, I write a little test, I write a little code, I'm writing those tests. If I have a pair partner with me, then the pair partner might write a test and I might make it pass, and then I might write the next test and make him make that pass, and then we'll alternate back and forth. That's a game called ping pong. When we play that game, it's an you know, easy thing to do. You and I have an interesting problem. We produce documents. Our code is a document full of arcane symbols in strange shapes and structure. No one else can read them, only programmers. Right? And every symbol has to be correct. Otherwise, terrible things happen. This sounds like I'm, I'm talking about a, a wizard spell in Dungeons and Dragons, right? You have to make, concoct this spell of strange symbols, and if one symbol is wrong, it might explode on you. That's kind of the, the thing that you and I do. Who else has a problem like that? Who else, what other field, what other employment has a problem like that? where they construct documents that are arcane and full of symbols, and every symbol has to be correct. Lawyers can get away by just changing the language. Right? They don't have to be precise about anything. They just, oh, because they're the only ones that can read that. They don't need anything. No, actually, lawyers is a good answer. Lawyers have to do that. But there's a better answer. Accountants. Accountants. Accountants fill really strange documents full of really bizarre symbols called numbers and no one understands them or why they're putting the numbers where they put the numbers or what the heck they're doing with these goofball numbers but every one of them has to be correct or terrible things happen <coughs> how do accountants make sure that their documents are correct they have a discipline a discipline that was invented 500 years ago it's called double entry bookkeeping. They enter every transaction twice. They keep it on two sets of books, once on the liability side, once on the asset side. And the way they enter their transactions, they're taught this in school, you enter a transaction on the asset side, you enter the same transaction on the liability side, you do the sums, and then there's a subtraction on the balance sheet. It must be a zero. And you do the next one, next transaction. Assets, sum, assets, liability, sum, zero on the balance sheet. Asset, liability, sum, zero on the balance sheet. That's how accountants enter data into their books. For obvious reasons. They enter everything twice. Test-driven development is double-entry bookkeeping. It's exactly the same discipline. It's done for precisely the same reason. We say everything twice. Once on the test side, once on the production code side, they follow execution, complementary execution pathways, they wind up at a zero. Zero test failed. Little test, little code, execute zero. Little test, little code, execute zero. Same discipline, same reason, same outcome. Do accountants have deadlines? Do managers yell at them and say, we need those spreadsheets by Tuesday? Do the accountants then turn around to each other and say, guys, we're really under the gun. The pressure's high. Do the assets. Forget the liabilities. <laughs> they do not. Yes, they go to jail if they do that. This carries the weight of law with it. Right? And besides that, they would never even think of doing that because 
They're professionals. Why is it we can't do this? Is there something special about software that we can't do this? Are accountants more professional than we are? Are their spreadsheets more important than the code we write? Are you kidding? The code we write is many times more critical than the spreadsheets. Often the code that we write is the thing that saves or makes the company money. You have a question. Yes. What is my opinion on inheritance, decoupling, and unit tests? So do I do unit tests on parent classes and on the child classes? Yes. Yeah. It can break because you have tight coupling in the inheritance. Inheritance is the tightest coupling we have. So we want to have as little inheritance as possible. Or if we do inherit, we want to inherit as few implemented things as possible. Right. However, how would I test a, uh, a parent class and a child class? I would write tests for all the functions in the parent class. I would write tests for all the functions in the child class. I would create instances of the parent class and test it. I would create instances of the child class and test it. I would make sure every line was tested. There's no magic there because it's, every class is just a bunch of functions and every function can be tested. Anybody else with a question? Yes. So uh, the question was, do I have any opinions on uh, a technique called mutation testing? Mutation testing is, is a lovely idea, and it requires that you have a suite of tests, and it, it requires that you have a code coverage tool. And then what the, what the mutation tool does is it runs all your tests, and it makes sure they all pass, and it measures the amount of coverage. And then the mutation tool reaches into your code, and it changes one critical thing. For example, it might take a double equal and turn it into a bang equal, a not equal. And then it runs the entire suite of tests again and measures all of the code coverage, and it expects that there must be a failure. If the tests still pass, the mutation is alive, and we don't want any of the mutations to live. So it'll do this over and over and over again, changing parts of your code, running the entire test suite, making sure that the mutations all die. And it will count all the mutations that, main, that still live, and it will show you the pathways that still live, and it'll show you what the changes were. It's a very effective way of making sure that the code coverage you have is also very high assert coverage. Now, the problem with mutation testing is that it's it, computationally expensive. So it's the kind of thing you can run with a decent tool uh, every once in a while. There's a very good tool in, in Java, which I, the name I can't remember. Someone probably remembers. What's that? PyTest is the, is the right name. And it, and it actually manipulates the byte codes instead of the source code, so it's a little more efficient than having to go through a recompile every time. It's a fascinating ex exercise. Take some small batch of code that you've got and run it through a mutation tester like this. You'll find things you never thought you'd find. Even if you've done test-driven development, you'll find stuff you never thought you'd find. Anybody else with a question? Because I'm about to do a demo of test-driven development. Who's seen a demo of test-driven development? Okay, that's not everybody. That's not even half of you, which surprises me. So here's the demo. I'm going to do a demo of test-driven development. Ah. Da -da -de 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 -da 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 okay. Do, 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 do. Yeah, cancel that. Good. All right. Um, I'm going to create a, a new project 
called Stack. You and I are going to write a stack together. This stack is going to be a stack of integers. We will begin with a stack test. So you can see I've created a JUnit test here called stack test. I'm going to write a test inside it, which I call nothing. This allows me to wire up JUnit into the project. Good. And now I should be able to run this test. Ha! Huh, it all passes. I'm a programmer. My nothing test works. The first thing I do with every project, every project begins the same way because now I have an execution environment. Now, what you and I are going to write is the class stack. A stack is a first in, last out data structure. So the first thing you push in is the last thing that'll come out. It's going to be a stack of nothing but integers. I'm not going to try and put generics in this thing. We're not going to do that. I'm not going to use any kind of uh, data structure other than an array. So we will work through the process of writing a stack. And I'll begin that by writing the very first test. Now, here's the problem. What am I supposed to test? I don't have any code. What am I supposed to test? And so here's the answer to this, and this is always the answer. You already know the code you want to write. If you weren't doing test-driven development, you know exactly what you'd write. You'd write public class stack. OK, so you just have to write the test that's going to force you to write the code you already know you want to write. This is always the rule. You write the test that forces you to write the code you already know you want to write. I already know I want to write public class stack, so what, do I have to, what test do I have to write in order to force myself to write public class stack? Create the stack, yes. So, OK, fine. I'll, I'll change the name of this to uh, create stack. That will not be the name of this test in the end. It's a reasonable name for the moment. OK, I want to create a stack. Yeah, uh, OK, what should I call this stack? Uh, my stack. I'll call it my stack. Stack equals new my stack. Oh, heavens, heavens, look at all the red. That red, that means it doesn't compile. I violated one of the laws. I've got to stop and see if I can create the stack. OK, I'll have the IDE create the stack for me, create class stack. Yeah, in the stack. There it is. Oh, good. Oh, it all compiles. And I'll bet it even runs. Ah, I'm a programmer, all right. I got that to work. Now, now I can refactor. I wrote a little test. I got it to pass. I can refactor this. And there's really only one refactoring I want to do. I don't want this to be called my stack. I want it to be called stack. I called it my stack because there's another class in the Java library called stack. And if I called this stack, it would collide with it until I had established it in a package named stack. And then everything's fine. Does this still pass? Oh, yes, it does. Good. OK. Now, notice that I'm not asserting anything. That's a bit puzzling. What should I assert about a brand new stack? It's empty. Yeah, OK, fine. So let's, let's assert true that stack dot is empty. Oh, heavens, it doesn't compile. Uh, let's see. Assert true doesn't compile. Why? Well, because you have to call that on the assert class. OK, whoa, that's not linked in. OK, let's link in the assert class from org j unit. Good, OK. And oh, heavens, I don't have an is empty function. All right, so I guess I'll have to create is empty. All right, good. Um, let's see, it should return false. That'll make it fail. That's a good thing. Let's see if it fails. Yes, it fails. Good. Now I need to make it pass, and I can do that by returning true. Programmer. Now I want to refactor a little bit. Now, by the way, people don't like what I just did. Lots of people look at that and go, that's stupid. Why'd you return a true there? That's not the real code that goes there. And my answer is, well, yeah, that's true. But I've just tested my test. I've seen my test both pass and fail. It took me no time at all. Why wouldn't I do this? So of course I'm going to do that. A little bit of refactoring. I can get rid of that assert dot by doing a static import, I think. Yeah, there we go. That should still work. Yep, good. OK. Oh, I should change the name of this test. All right. Uh, what should the test be called? 
Um, uh, empty stack. Oh, no. New stack is empty. Good. Perfect. Okay, next test. Ooh, pushing. I got to push something onto the stack. Push. Okay. Uh, what should I call the test? Push. I'll change the name later. Oh, I need a stack. Uh, stack, stack equals new stack. Oh, heavens, I've got duplicate code there. Look at that. I've already got that line there. And now I've got it here. I'm going to have to refactor that. But not yet, because I don't have a, f a passing test. Can't refactor until you have a passing test. All right, I need to push. Stack dot push. What should I push? Zero. I'll push a zero. All right. Ooh, there is no push function. Look at that. It's red. All right, we'll create the push function. Ooh, that was weird. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, oh, good, yes. All right. Uh, void? Yes. Yeah, it should return void. Uh, I? No. No. Element. I don't need anything else. Good. Um, what should I assert here? Should not be empty. Good. All right. Uh, assert false. Uh, stack dot is empty. That's good. Okay. Um, I don't have an assert false, so let's see if I can get that. That should be in the assert class. I happen to know that. Okay. Oh, yeah, that seemed to work. Now I should be able to do the static import. This should, this should, I'm not sure what it'll do. Oh, it'll fail. Yeah, it fails. Right. Okay. Because now it should not be empty. Okay. How do I make this pass? Well, I can't return a true there anymore. Yeah, I could try that, right? <laughs> if I could type false, right? But I think that's going to fail the other test. Yeah, it fails the other test. So now, now I'm going to have to actually engage one or two brain cells here. Now, one of the rules of test-driven development is that you engage as few brain cells as possible because you're going to need them later, right? So don't do too much too fast. So was, okay, I'm going to have to do something here, though. And I think what I'm going to do is take that false, and I'll turn it into a field of the class called uh, is empty. Okay, so now it's a field of the class. That's good. And I should probably initialize it here to be true because it starts out as empty. I don't need this assignment statement there. That, I don't know how that got there. I think that was the original initialization. And now when I do a push, I should say is empty equals false. Oh. Test pass. Now, there's already people in the room going, this guy's an idiot. Yeah. What, what is he, what kind of gunk is it? Hold on, hold on. Yeah. It's going to get more frustrating soon. <laughs> I've got some duplicate code here. I need to deal with this duplicate code. And, and the duplicate code is here and here. Now, I can deal with that by extracting the stack variable into a field of the class initialized in the setup method, which my IDE will happily do for me. So now I have a stack, stack.stack, .stack, heavens. Well, that's unfortunate. Okay, good. There's, a, there's my field of the test that holds the stack. I've got a setup function that creates the stack. That's nice. I have my new stack is empty function, which asserts that the stack is empty without bothering to create it. That's nice. And now I can eliminate that creation from that test. I think that'll pass. It does. Now I can change the name of this test to um, after, w after one push is not empty. Okay. And I think that'll still pass. Ah, excellent. Good. Okay, next test case. So the way these tests run in JUnit is an, an instance of the stack test class will be created, the setup function will be called, and then the first test function will be called. Then another instance of the, st of the stack test function will be created, 
the setup function will be called, and then the next test function will be called. Is that the question you were asking me? OK, all right. So next test case. Yes? Pop. Yeah, we could do that. Pop. What should we test? Oh, an empty stack. See, there's a QA mindset going on here, right? <laughs> Somebody is thinking, uh, I bet those programmers might pop an empty stack. It's a good idea. So let's pop an empty stack. What should it do if we pop an empty stack? It should throw an exception. Should, will throw underflow, will throw underflow when empty stack is popped. Good. Notice I wrote the name first. Now I kind of know what test I'm writing. OK. Uh, ooh. In order to make sure that it throws an underflow, I can do this. Expected equals stack, stack dot underflow dot class. Right? That, this now tells me what exception it should throw. Ooh, I don't have an underflow class. Well, let's create that. Uh, create the class underflow in the stack class. So this is now an inner class of stack class. I always like my exceptions to be inner, inner classes of the class that throws them. So this is stack.underflow. It should derive from an exception class. So this should say extends uh, runtime exception. Okay, good. I always like to extend runtime exception because I don't like the type checking on exceptions. Okay, that's fine. That's the... That's the e exception that we should be throwing. Now, here, we want to say stack.pop. Oh, heavens, I don't have a stack.pop. All right, so I should create the pop function. Void? No, it should return an int. Uh, OK, 0. I don't like 0. Let's return negative 1. OK. Do, 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 do. Run the test. Oh, test fails. Why? Because it expected the exception. All right, I need to throw the exception. Well, OK, I can do that. Throw new underflow. Yeah, OK. Oh, heavens. OK, now I don't need the return. This should pass. Ah, pass. OK, good. All right, next test case. Yes? That's true. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, it's a good question. Why did, I, why did I declare the pop function to return an int when the test didn't require it to return anything? I, I could have had the pop function return a void. But I knew that it was going to return an int in the end, and I, engraved, I engaged one extra brain cell. I figured I could afford it, you know. We're not really 100% stupid here. <laughs> we just pretend to be. So, um, OK, next test case. What's that? Pop? OK, is there something simpler? One push, one pop, and the stack should be empty again. That's simpler. OK? After one push and one pop will be empty. <laughs> stack dot push, zero. Stack dot pop, assert true. Stack dot is empty. Ooh, look at that. OK. Oh, it failed. Ooh, it threw an exception. Yeah, that's right, because I'm throwing an exception. OK, um, when do I want to throw this exception? Only when the stack is empty. So if it is empty, then I can throw the exception. Otherwise, I should return negative 1. OK, now I can run the test. Test fails. Why? 
Um, because the is empty failed, didn't it? Let's see. Oh, yeah, right there. That's what failed. Okay, so now I have to make it... Um, oh, I think I could do this. Programmer! <laughs> now, at this point, most of you are going, would you just write the damn stack? <laughs> Sorry? I can put bugs in my code anytime I want to put bugs in my code. It's very easy. Yeah, yeah it's so, so it's a very interesting observation. Am I using any brain cells at all here? Or am I just making the tests pass by doing imbecilic things. Okay, and I am. I'm making the test pass by doing imbecilic things. Does this mean I'm adding bugs into my code? Yes. This is empty flag is just the wrong solution, right? It's the wrong solution. We know that already. So now, at this point, we engage a new brain cell. And here's how we engage the new brain cell. We say, okay, I know that this is empty flag. Let's look at it. This thing right here, that's the wrong solution. What test can I write that will prove that that's the wrong solution? Push twice, pop once. Perfect, okay? So, uh, oh, don't, you don't want to see my email, do you? <laughs> All right, so I've now engaged a strategic brain cell here. This is a strategic test to force me to write a better solution, because I know the current solution is wrong. So test, okay. Uh, after two pushes and one pop will not be empty. Okay, stack dot push, zero, stack dot push, zero. Might as well push zero, stack dot pop. Assert true, assert false, stack dot is empty. Huh. This fails. Good. How do I make that pass? I got to count it, don't I? There's no way to do this. I got to count it. It's only going to be empty if the number of pushes and the number of pops are equal. I could use two booleans. This violates a rule. There is a rule that this violates. And the rule is that you are not allowed to make the, the production code more specific than the tests. I'm going to back up here just a second. The, the tests and the production code move in opposite directions. Every new test you add makes the tests more constrained, more specific. Everything you do to the production code makes the production code more general. That's a rule of test-driven development. So you must drive the two in the opposite direction. If I use two Booleans, I would be making the production code more specific because I would know that I was doing that to pass one test. I must make the production code more general. How do I do that? And you set a counter. Let's use the counter. Simple counter. Uh, private int size equals Zero, it starts at zero, that's fine. Um, let's see, empty should be size equals zero. That should be fine, okay. Uh, when we push it, we increment the size, okay. So I can do this, size plus plus. When we pop it, we decrement the size. So I should be able to do this, minus minus size. Uh, now I'm not using this empty flag. I think I can take it away, run my tests. Ho! That was magic, wasn't it? Huh? All the tests are passing. 
One simple little change made it a little more general. Yeah, it was magical. Okay, next test. Ah, it's complicated. <laughs> a, a pop after, all right, all right. I mean, you, you know, now there's another rule here, and, and the reason I've been doing this is to emphasize these rules. The, the other rule here is, is that you don't go for the gold. If you're writing a stack, what is the golden behavior of a stack? The central behavior of, a st of the stack is first in, last out. And when you're doing test-driven development, you avoid the central behavior for as long as you possibly can. You don't run in and go for the gold. You write tests up for everything else around the outside first. This is why you're so frustrated with me, right? Because I'm sitting there going, well, what about the counter? You know, what about it's empty and not empty? I'm doing all the stuff around the outside, and you guys are going, just write the stick. Okay. Prepare to be even more frustrated. <laughs> oh, come on, Bob. Test. Good. After pushing X, will pop X. Stack dot push. 99. Why 99? I don't know. It's easy to type. Sert equals 99. Stack dot pop. Oh, let's see. Big assert. Uh, yeah, okay, good. I can do the little static import. Good, run the test, and it fails because it was a negative one. Well, I can make that pass. Okay. <laughs> but now... Knowing that I had done that, I will augment the test. <sighs> okay. Okay, now I got a problem. I got to save this thing that I pushed, right? I can't just return a 99. So I'm going to have to save it. I'm going to take this 99 here, and I'm going to turn it into a field of the class called uh, element. Good. And there, there it is up there. That's nice. I don't need to assign it a 99. That doesn't need to be there anymore. Uh, I probably ought to initialize it to 0, or maybe negative 1 would be better. And then uh, when I push it, I should say um, uh, uh, element, ah, yes, this dot element, meaning the field, equals element, meaning the argument. Hmm. Pass. Yeah. Oh, you mean I could extract this out as a single int? I could say I could have an int named x and replace that 99 with an x? So you don't need the stack push 88 because uh, the first test forces you to, to extract a private member, so an attribute in the stack class because you... You mean this test? So if I got rid of the yes, second one... Yes, and just implement the 99 in the stack. Just return the 99. I did. Yes, yep. and then you see that there's a redundancy because the test has a fixed number, 99, and... Oh, you mean the 299s are there? Yes, and... Yeah, it's a, that's duplicated code. Yes, like this. <laughs> you don't really need the 88 because... Okay. That's, I buy that. But I'm still going to do this. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> next test. We're going to have to go for the gold here now. Push twice, pop twice. Yep, that's it. That's going for the gold. That's going to be first in, last out behavior. After pushing X and Y, will pop Y then X. That's first in, last out behavior. Stack dot push. 
99. Stack dot push. 88. Assert equals 88. Stack dot pop. Assert equals 99. Stack dot pop. That's first in, last out. This is the first time we're actually testing stack-like behavior. It'll fail. Oh, now I'm going to have to write the stack. Okay, well, one element is not sufficient. I'm going to have to make it an array. Okay. Oh, I should probably change the name to elements. And I cannot initialize it to a negative one. I have to initialize it to a new int of, I don't need any more than two right now. <laughs> now this does not compile, but I can make it compile by putting brackets in there. Oh, I need something to put in the brackets. And Oh, look at this, I've got that. Huh, well, let's just move that in there. Hmm, okay. And, uh, oh, I need brackets there. Okay. And I need something to put in the brackets. Oh, I've got that. Let me just put that in there. <laughs> My test passed, so damn you. <laughs> uh, I've just written a stack. And notice that all that code that I had surrounded it with, all those tests, forced me to build up that counter. And it was the counter that was critical to doing first in, last out. Did you know that? That the counter was sufficient for first in, last out? Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. But it became obvious at this point, I had already implemented the counter long before. I had done all the work for the stack. This happens very frequently when you're doing test-driven development. As you avoid going for the gold, you surround the entire problem with all this ancillary testing of all the interface and all the validation, and all of a sudden you realize that you've done all the work, and all you need to do is rearrange a few things, and the gold just comes out of it almost for free. You've seen a number of the, of the bits of discipline here. It would be a mistake to think that that's all there is to test-driven development. Test-driven development is actually a very rich topic. There's lots and lots of stuff to do in this discipline. That's just the first little bit of it. And even that probably left you very frustrated. Like, why would you ever do that? But I've already given you the justification as to why. So I think that problem is solved. Could you do this? And the answer to that is yes. Any programmer can learn this. But beware. If you decide one day that you are going to do test-driven development at work, you will fail. You will fail spectacularly enough to convince yourself to never do test-driven development again. The reason for this is that test-driven development is a rather significant skill. It takes months to get enough skill to bring it to work safely. So you cannot just leap in one day and say, you know what, we're doing test-driven development and all of us are doing test-driven development because it will be probably the worst week of your life. What you have to do is learn the skill externally. Now, how are you going to do that? How are you going to learn the skill externally? Well, maybe you can have lunchtime meetings where you practice this kind of thing, or maybe you can just at lunch by yourself, open up your laptop and do a little exercise. There's loads and loads of exercises out there that you can do. You can go search for code katas and TDD exercises. There's tons of them. And you should probably work them when you've got some spare time. Maybe you'll even do this at home. Professionals often take work home and work at home. Maybe you've got the time to do that. I hope you do. But do not take it to work and think you're going to make it work there. Learn it well first. Get good at it. Know that you are good at it, and then bring it to work. And you will find it to be very, very rewarding at work once you're good at it. There are lots of techniques that you need to learn, lots of strategies that you need to learn. It is not an insignificant skill. So you are warned. Are there any questions? And by the way, here, 
We've got about 15 minutes left. Sorry. Ugh. Are there any questions about anything? Okay. What about the if statement without brackets? I am on a mission to destroy all braces. I do not want if statements or while statements with brackets in them because then they have more than one line. And I don't want if statements or while loops to have more than one line. I'm going to work very hard to get those if statements and while loops down to one line. If you want to put more than one line in there, you put the damn brackets in. <laughs> what about the test commit or revert? You mean with git? Oh, oh, Kent Beck's love, lovely thing. So Kent Beck has come up with this idea that uh, you, will write, you, will, you will write a test, and if it fails, it just reverts your code. It throws all your code away, right? So then you have to write the test that passes. Now, this is an interesting idea. You write a failing test. You, make it, you try to make it pass. You hit the button, and if you fail to make it pass, it just throws all the code away. Now, don't laugh too much at that. That's very interesting. It reverts the code to the last state, so it doesn't throw everything away. What it does do, however, is it forces you into this mindset of thinking through the last test pretty carefully so that you're pretty sure it's going to pass. And then if it fails, it means that you've really forgotten something significant. Now, I haven't done this. I haven't played Kent's game on this one, so I, I, I can't speak from experience. I just think it's kind of interesting. The last thing, the last time Kent Beck proposed something like this and I adopted it was 1999 and that was test-driven development. And I thought, okay, because I, I thought test-driven development was a dumb idea. You know, in 1999, I thought, well, what, what kind of, who, what idiot would write their test first? That's just stupid. Right? And then I went to Medford, Oregon, where Kent Beck lived, and I sat down with him, and I pair programmed with him for two hours, and I came away with an extremely different perspective. I'd never seen anything like that. I'd been programming for 35 years at that point. I never thought somebody was going to show me some intimate new technique for writing code. But here was this thing that he was doing, and he was going around this cycle every five seconds, and I was, I, my mind was completely blown. I didn't think that was possible. And I went away from that and I said, oh, I, I got to learn this. I have to learn. And it took me a, a good long time to learn it. And I made a ton of mistakes along the way. So you're warned again. Yes. Um, what about outside in between the uh, while loop values for the problem? <laughs> Where you write the tests for the high level first and then when you can't make it past, then you drop a, lay, uh, a lower lay level until you reach something very low level. So like this is a little bit of inside baseball in test-driven development. There are two fundamental strategies for doing test-driven development. One of them is called outside-in, and the other one is called stateful, or uh, some people call it classicist, but that's an odd name. Uh, the outside-in approach makes heavy use of mocks and test doubles. If you don't know what those are, uh, that's something that we'll have to talk about at another time. The statist approach does not make heavy use of test doubles. It relies instead on the return values of functions. And there are trade there are trade-offs for each one. There's, there's costs and benefits for each one. I just did a video series with Sandra Mancuso out doing a, a full-on Twitter replication outside in and then a full-on Twitter replication again using the, the statist approach. It's 15 hours of video, right? In, in one hour segments, right? But it's fascinating to see him do the one and then me do the other in the comparison of the two. So if you've got the 15 hours and you wanna, you wanna study how that is and watch a bunch of guys code for 15 hours, then you, know, you can get those videos and watch them. They're pretty interesting. Cleancoders.com, C-L-E-A-N-C-O-D-E-R-S.com. It's called London versus Chicago. Huh? 
written better quality code? Uh, would you say that everyone should adopt it even if it's not fun, so it's just a sort of a necessary evil because it's the best method out there? Or do you honestly believe that it would be fun for just about anyone if you've invested the time to learn it? So I can't speak to whether it's going to be fun for you. It's fun for me. You know, I've been a programmer for over 50 years. And I still just love to code. It's, you know, I wake up in the morning, I want to write code. It's what I love to do. And test-driven development makes it much more fun than it used to be. So, yeah, for me it's fun. Now, I don't know if it's going to be fun for you. But it is fun for me. Should people do test-driven development? Is there some kind of moral issue here? Is this part of the ethics that I was talking about in the morning? I don't know if I can say that. I believe so. You know, m for me, I believe so. I think it would be unethical for me to write code for someone else and not do test-driven development. Because from, from, from my point of view now, it is a part of my ethics. Can I push that on you? I don't think I have the authority to do that yet. I think we as a group have to decide what is ethical and what is not. That may be one of the things. It certainly turned out that way for the accountants. You know, it took, it took 500 years for the accountants to convince everybody to do double entry bookkeeping. The last country to adopt it was in 1945. Right. So it was not an easy, easy thing to convince all the accountants in the world that they should do double entry bookkeeping, but it was achieved. It took 500 years. Uh, yeah. I hope it doesn't take 500 years for us. Yeah, uh, I had a question about integration tests. So we talked about unit tests a lot. Uh, so what is your advice on integration tests? And how can you tackle that the best? So there are several layers of tests here. I've only talked about one layer, which are the unit tests at the bottom of the testing pyramid. As you climb the testing pyramid, there are more and more interesting tests. So the next layer up would be component level tests, or some people call them acceptance tests. These are typically written by QA. This is where QA moves to the front of the process. We want QA writing these tests. And usually they write them in a tool that is not a programming language. It's a test specification language. Right? Fitness, JBehave, SpecFlow, there's a whole bunch of these. Uh, and we want the QA people and the business analysts writing those level, those level tests. They are business rule tests. The next level up are the integration level tests. Integration level tests check the plumbing of the system. They don't check business rules. They check that the communication flows through the system are correct and that the components dance well. Those are usually written in code by architects or leads or tech leads who understand the dynamics of the system. So that's where I would put those. There's several layers yet to come beyond that. Right? The, the testing pyramid actually has quite a few layers to it. When we run tests in an Agile project, in a real Agile project, we are running many, many layers of tests. Everything gets tested much more than once. Next. Yes. Yeah. Um, what is your opinion on the habit that, uh, I see this all the time, that every production class should have a corresponding unit test class? <laughs> okay. Um, you will find this, especially if you start reading books on test-driven development, you will see all of the examples show you that there's one test class per production code class. You don't want to do this. Because when you do this, you are coupling the structure of the tests to the structure of the application code. And you don't want them coupled. You don't want to, you, you will create the fragile test problem by doing that. What you want instead is for the production code to evolve in one direction, which is general, and the tests to evolve in another direction, which is specific. They will have very different shapes. Now, the way you do that is you write unit tests, and then you refactor the production code. And then you write more unit tests, and you refactor the production code. And you keep that exercise going. And as you're refactoring the production code, you're extracting out methods and extracting out classes. You do not need to write specific unit tests for the classes you have extracted because you're still already testing them. You do not need to write specific unit tests for the functions you have extracted because you're still already testing them. So the test code will look very different structurally from the application code, and that's exactly what you want. That's one of the ways you decouple the two so that you don't get the fragile test problem. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? 
Um, a lot about, uh, of the idea, ideas you presented today to us are represented in the software craftsmanship movement, I guess. Yes. Um, so I'm really interested in that and I would like to know where can I learn more? What are some of the conferences or groups I can go to to connect me with more like-minded people and learn even more? So probably the premier software craftsmanship conference is in London once a year. And it's Software Craftsmanship London. There's also um, a Software Craftsmanship North America that you can find, SCNA it's called, and you'll find that, that um, uh, conference. That's about all for, for conferences that are specific to software craftsmanship. There are, however, many conferences that are extremely good, like the GoTo conferences and the Jowl conferences those are, and the, the DevOx conferences. Those are all very good conferences. Uh, and, and you will learn a lot about software craftsmanship in those conferences within the, the, uh, talk, the talk threads uh, that are on software craftsmanship. And there always is some. So that's, that's another way to do that. Um, yeah. Where's um, my microphone? Yep, go. Oh, okay. um, Whoever's got the yeah. microphone. Yep. Um, you told uh, about the ah, present. Yeah, <laughs> you told about the present situation of uh, software development, about the sequence, selection, and iteration. Yes, the three key principles, and all that we are doing is just adding a new abstraction to that. Uh, do you have a vision of the future of software development, how <laughs> it will be? Do I have a vision of the future of software development? Yes. Um, a unification of all the three paradigms, structured, functional, and object-oriented. Right? At some point, we will finally learn all three of these. Currently, everybody knows structured and object-oriented. Very few people know functional. Right? At some point, we will all know all three of these, and the languages we will use will be functional, object-oriented, structured languages. I'd like that language, I'd like that language to become the last language seems to me that it's about time for us to consolidate and avoid the uh, never-ending spin for languages and consolidate the industry on one or two or maybe three basic languages that we all use. I would love for one of those languages to be Lisp. Lisp is the language that refuses to die. We've tried to kill it. <laughs> it will not die. It keeps coming back. There's a question here. We have a microphone. Got one there, and then bring the microphone down to here next. Or say you first, then her. Quick question on the TDD you yeah. did just now. Uh, adding a second constructor, you put the constructor in the setup method. That means you can't use any other constructor. Would you add a second test class, or would you, again, remove the setup method and move the constructors back into all the test methods? Yeah, I would do that. I would, I would restructure the constructors, because this is all temporary code here. Right. So as I needed more. So for example, uh, one of the constructors I'm going to need here is a constructor that has the number of elements in the stack. All right, so I'd have to go back and restructure that, and that's fine. It would force me to change the setup code, but I'm willing to do that. There you go. Can I ask? Yes? <laughs> yeah, it's um, about testing and QA, because I think I, you were talking that like QA department should become more obsolete, let's say, because we should test our code well. But we are developers, so the way we think and the way user acts, <laughs> it's very different sometimes. So you can cover everything with unit tests, but then the user logs in and he does like, wow, the things you never expected him to do, let's say. How would uh, that would be deal? So I, d I don't want the QA department to become obsolete. I don't want them testing at the end. I want them testing at the beginning. I want them writing the tests. So the acceptance test and the component level test, I want written by the QA folks. And if they're programmers, if, if the QA is developers, more power to them. Write the tests in code. You know, we don't want to use these funky tools if, if you can actually write the code. Now, how do you deal with the fact that users will do crazy things? And, and the way we deal with that, first of all, is you observe users, and then you start writing tests that test the things that the crazy users do. And the other thing you do is, is you, you engage in something called exploratory testing. This is the only manual testing that I, that I think is worthwhile. And exploratory testing is when you hand the system to a group of people and tell those people to break the system. You have a week 
Break this system. Find every way you can to break this system. And, and it, there are people who specialize in this. It's, it's fun to go through airports with them. That's not QA. I know an expert who's very good at breaking systems. He can walk past ticket machines and have them all down. Right? So fascinating to, wa to, to watch these guys. They have a whole bunch of techniques for breaking systems. Uh, or if you don't want to hire the experts, you can do it internally and just you know, have a bunch of people bang on the system, see if they can figure out ways to break it. Of course, the best people to break the system are the users. They will always find the way. Right? It's just the way of it, and you'll have to be prepared for that and then write those tests. And with that, I think we are done. It is t two minutes after five. Thank you all for your attention. And tomorrow we meet again. Thank you.